On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, a container ship is broken down off the coast of New Zealand. I'm your host, Sal McCoglano. Welcome to today's episode. So container ships and New Zealand have a long checkered history together going back to the disastrous loss of the container ship Rena. This new issue involves a container ship which has a very checkered history as you're going to find out in sailing out of New Zealand. The vessel has broken down but is now anchored in the Tasman uh, Bay just north of Nelson uh, which is at the northern end of the southern island of New Zealand. We're going to talk about this vessel, we'll talk about the history of container ships in and around New Zealand, why shipping is so essential to New Zealand, problems that New Zealand has with shipping and its larger implication. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this story. So this vessel is a 66,500 deadweight ton container ship, carries about 5,000 TEU. The ship had just been released from a 24-day detention in Wellington. I'm gonna go back into some of the problems with this ship, but the ship had a history of failures, including power failures. And the Wellington Harbor Master had called into question the ship's reliability. Now, the detention was listed, lifted on Wednesday, May 10th, after the ship successfully tested its engines. It got underway on Thursday, but had to do it in evasion because of bad weather. However, early Friday morning, a Mayday call went out from the vessel, and the vessel actually reported that the crew was preparing to abandon ship. So rescue teams were dispatched along with an Air Force plane and tugs. And the uh, tug, the Scandi Emerald, arrived on scene about 4.30 p.m. on Friday and after about five and about five and a half hours after the mayday call came in they were able to get a tow onto the vessel and they were successfully able to tow the vessel out of danger and now it's being held there just north of nelson so here's the track of the vessel and its current position brought to you by a marine traffic as you'll see the vessel departed Wellington headed out, had that diversion area, went to sea, and then right here is where she lost power and began to drift. And the crew reported again the potential of having to abandon ship. Now, obviously, that's not an issue that is taken lightly in any way. Currently, uh, a Maritime New Zealand incident response team is on scene. They're assessing the vessel and determining where to bring the vessel into port. Right now, she's just at anchor holding her position, but they're going to eventually have to bring this ship into port. This is a maritime executive report uh, previously done on this. This came out on April 17th, and it talks about the issues regarding this vessel. As you can see right here, New Zealand restricts box ship sailing after a third breakdown in a year. So the regional harbor master for Wellington, New Zealand, issued a direction for a problem-plagued container ship after it experienced a third power outage in less than 12 months, which is a, a, not a great track record. For this, Grant Nadler said he was acting in the interest of ensuring maritime safety while telling the local media the port was not happy after the ship blacked out yet again while maneuvering to depart the port on April 14th. The ship is a 2005 vessel, but it was sold in 2020 under its current management. And we're going to look at that current management in a second. Outbound on April 14th, she was in a main shipping channel when the ship reported losing power. It's what, the, it's what you call in, in, in shipping dropping the plant. Uh, she drifted out of the main channel, crossed a sandbar before she dropped both anchors. Two harbor tugs came to the assistance, and later in the day, she was moved back to the dock. Uh, then it was reported the Schilling had lost, also had a brief power stoppage on February 11th in Wellington Harbor. She also suffered an engine failure on July 4th of 2022. And that's just in and around New Zealand. There's no telling what issues this vessel has suffered in its normal sailing routine, which should throw a lot of red flags about this vessel and what is going on with it. So here is Schilling right now. This is uh, a side ship tracker. She operates here on this route between uh, New Zealand to Singapore and uh, Malaysia. And you see that. As a matter of fact, if you look at the most uh, visited ports, over the last year. 
Singapore is the one that has it the most. And then a series of New Zealand ports rank up there. So this ship is really being a feeder ship. It is taking cargo out of Singapore and then delivering it to New Zealand in a variety of ports in and around New Zealand. Singapore is a major transportation hub, one of the largest ports in the world. So goods coming from Asia, from Europe, all congregate there in Singapore. And then you get a feeder ship like this, a 5,000 TEU feeder ship that will go in and around the smaller ports around New Zealand, which is absolutely essential for getting goods in New Zealand. And the reason for the 5,000 TEU ship is a couple of reasons. Uh, New Zealand has a population of just over 5 million people. Uh, you're split between the North and South Island. So you don't have a large population concentration. So you have to d disperse to the major cities. And you can see that with them going to Wellington, uh, to Taronga, to Auckland, to Leighton. They also go over to Australia there. You'll see they go into Brisbane. Uh, on the way across. So this is essential for New Zealand because New Zealand itself does not have a merchant marine in which they can do this. They don't have a coastal fleet to, to do this. So they're dependent on these foreign ships to do this transportation, which is fairly normal around the world. We see this almost everywhere. When you look at this ship, this is from Lloyd's. The ship is classified with Lloyd's registry. So I pulled up the Lloyd's registry here. You'll see it here, the shilling with their IMO number. That's their international maritime organization. Every ship has a set number that is it's with the vessel forever you can't change it you can change names you can change ownership but you can't change the owner uh the imo number it's with an organization called shilling navigation pte limited so i pulled up the information on shilling navigation this is from companies in singapore this company was incorporated in uh january of 2020 so it's just three years old uh, the address is Caldecott Hill Estates, 23 Olive Road. Uh, and I pulled it up and it's a residential area. The business's uh, main activity is shipping lines and chartering of ships. Company's paid up capital is 50,000 US dollars. And when you come down here and you look at it, uh, number one, you'll see that that same address, there are other uh, companies here. There's uh, Shimin Navigation, there's Xinjiang Navigation, and Shimin Holding. PTE. So one of the things that happens a lot to basically create walls for vessels is you'll take a ship and incorporate it under an individual company. That company then in turn will make a agreement with a larger company. And the idea being if something happens to the ship, you sue the owner of the company, but there's almost no assets there but the ship with very little money. And you see this throughout in shipping. And and these these are, are I wouldn't say the red flags because this happens all the time in shipping, but most people don't know anything about this. And so that's one of the reasons I wanted to highlight it. You come over here to Schilling. And so one of the things that Lloyd's do and all uh, classification societies do is this ship is flagged in Singapore. Uh, it was built in Korea. Uh, and the classification society, in this case, Lloyd's, basically ensures that the vessel is meeting all the requirements for international shipping agreements. So for example, surveys, you'll see right here, there are a red flag here for 12 surveys that are coming due on this vessel. And so you'll see here, her annual survey is due on 30 April of 2023. Well, this is being filmed in early May of 2023 when this occurs. Now they have until July of 2023 to get it done. So it's due soon, but you'll see that the rest of these are either overdue or due. So this vessel is really close to its window of getting its surveys done. Uh, ship was probably heading back to Singapore to go ahead and do its statutory, its machinery and its hull surveys. Uh, but like I said, probably not getting done right now because the vessel is being held. Now, this is not unusual. Uh, ships will go until the very end to do their surveys. But again, a, a kind of a red flag. This vessel was bought by a brand new company. It's getting a little bit long in the teeth right now in terms of age. Uh, the company doesn't really have a big track record that we can find. And now you know this vessel is already broken down. This is the fourth time the vessel has broken down. And New Zealand, under their port state control agreement, should be flagging this vessel for not coming back because this is a disaster waiting to happen, it appears. Again, you, you don't need my track record for it. The, the harbor master at Wellington identified issues with this vessel and we're seeing it in its classification society. 
Why this becomes so important is when you look at the maritime profile of New Zealand. This comes from UNCTAD, uh, the UN uh, Conference on Trade and Development. They're the ones that publish the review of maritime transport every year, but they also have a maritime profile of every nation in the world. And when you look at, at this, it provides a really interesting little bit of information. So just to read a couple of the issues here. So is shipbuilding. There's no shipbuilding at all recorded in New Zealand. Uh, when you look at the fleet, the national flag, 115 ships, 205,000 deadweight tons, 1,889 seafarers. Uh, these are small coastal vessels that operate in and around. They're really not the ones moving cargo. New Zealand basically doesn't have a ocean-going, coastwise merchant marine of any measure whatsoever. Yet, if you look at their container port throughput, they handle about 3.2 million TEUs a year. There's over 11,000 port calls. Their national flag fleet, less than 0.01% of the world total uh, in terms of value, 0.02%. In terms of ownership by deadweight tons, less than 0.01%. Shipbuilding, less than 0.01%. And even in terms of seafarers and ratings, it, it's, it's under 0.19% uh, uh, for officers, 0.03% for ratings, and those officers are probably working on cruise ships or something along those lines. So New Zealand has, you know, is a great textbook example of a country that got rid of its national merchant marine. It's basically outsourced all its shipping, and that's having an impact on it too. If you look at New Zealand, look at the Royal New Zealand Navy, for example. So the Royal New Zealand Navy has nine vessels, it's not a big navy by any means. Uh, but they operate nine vessels, everything from uh, frigates to support vessels uh, to a combination logistics amphibious vessel to some uh, uh, patrol vessels. So not a huge Navy, a, a good kind of all around fleet, I would argue. Uh, it's, it's a good kind of image of a fleet. But then you realize that they're having such a hard time that this story from Reuters uh, back in December of 2022, New Zealand Navy idle ships as labor crisis hits. Three of New Zealand's nine naval ships are sitting idle in port as higher civilian salaries lure personnel out of the military, the country's defense forces said on Wednesday, even as tensions in the Pacific rise between China and its allies. I would argue this has a huge impact in New Zealand. It's one of the things that happens when you outsource your commercial fleet uh, you lose the shipbuilding, you lose that maritime base, you lose the, the incentive for people to want to deal with oceans and going to sea and, and do career paths that way. And in many ways, uh, the New Zealand Navy is kind of reflective in that, in that the New Zealand Navy doesn't really see uh, a mission at this time for protecting trade because most of its trade is handled by foreign ships. And the Sterling is a perfect example of one of these dangers that you see. Uh, it's very easy to sit there and say, hey, let's get rid of the Sterling. Let's just get rid of it. We'll, we'll boycott it. We'll get rid of it. And we're not going to have it. Well, the problem is you need ships like Sterling bringing cargo into New Zealand. You can't bring those huge, massive vessels like the 20,000 box, you know, ever given or ever a lot into the region. You can't bring all these other vessels in because, again, the Ports can't handle them, and there's not a need for it because you only have 5 million people across New Zealand. You need small feeder vessels, less than 7,000 TEU boxes that can be accommodated in ports. You don't want to overwhelm the ports with too many containers. You don't have the warehouse space. You don't have the refrigeration space. And what you want is regularly sailing. And so you have to depend on companies like this to bring your cargo in. Uh, this is why there are vessel sharing agreements out there uh, that everyone wants to bash the big container alliances, but usually these container alliances will ensure that there is some participation into and out of these ports. And this is a problem for New Zealand, but not just New Zealand. Many countries across the board find themselves really in the hands of these commercial companies that unfortunately may not have the best reputation. And again, if you blackball, does that mean you're not going to have a ship to replace it coming in? Or are you going to have to pay even more money to get a ship coming in? Because remember, New Zealand's issues with container ships go back to one of the worst disasters off the coast of New Zealand, and that was the loss of the Rena. 
when the Rena, which was a container ship, hit a reef, uh, the disaster there was massive. This story by Mike Schuller, and I'll have it in the show notes for you, uh, relooked at this disaster. It happened back in October of 2011. He went back and looked at it 10 years later. And the disaster was the ship ran aground, but the salvage was prolonged. It was very difficult. The ship was very heavily loaded. At the time, the ship began to lose its containers because of the situation on the reef. And then eventually the ship began to break apart. And eventually that is exactly what happened. Uh, The ship came apart, broke apart, and then the salvage effort became a huge mess. Uh, I really recommend you take a look at this story because I think Mike does a great job of encapsulating uh, what happens here with the Rena and the dangers that uh, nations face, especially in ships that they have very little oversight of and control. You can prevent them from coming into your ports and waters, but if you're dependent on foreign shipping, for your cargo and bringing it in, then what recourse do you really have? And I think that's the warning bell with nearly 10, 11 years after, uh, almost 12 years now, after Rena, this should be the concern that everybody in New Zealand has. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, you can hit that super thanks button down below where you can contribute directly to the page, or wait for the link to come up and you'll see a Patreon link or down in the show notes and you become a patron of the page where you can contribute either monthly or yearly as little, as little as $2. Until our next episode, this is Sal signing off.